This is the Ministry of Truth. I'm Gordon Comstock. And we're going to get into Chapter 5 here of Volume 1 of Gustavus Myers' uh, The History of the Great American Fortunes. The Shippers and Their Times. Unfortunately, only the most general and eulogistic accounts of the careers of most of the rich shippers have appeared in such biographies as have been published. Scarcely any details are preserved of the underlying methods and circumstances by which these fortunes were amassed. Sixty years ago, when it was the unqualified fashion to extol the men of wealth as great public benefactors and truckle to them, it still is the fashion, Gustavus, it's that, that fashion has returned. And when sociological inquiry was in an undeveloped stage, there might have been some excuse for this, but it is extremely unsatisfactory to find pretentious writers of the present day glossing over essential facts or not taking the trouble to get them. A quote-unquote popular writer who has pretended to deal with the origin of what a, one of the great present fortunes, the Astor fortune. Here we go, we're getting into the, uh, the robber baron families. Ha and has already given facts, although conventionally interpreted, as to one or two of Astor's land transactions, passes over with a sentence with a single sentence, the fundamental facts as to Astor's shipping activities, and entirely ignores the peculiar special privileges worth millions of dollars that Astor, in conjunction with other merchants, had as a free gift from the government. This omission is characteristic. You get the feeling Gustavus Myers, were he alive today, could see right through the lies of our mainstream media today. This omission is characteristic inasmuch as it leaves the reader in complete ignorance of the kind of methods Astor used in heaping up millions from the shipping trade, millions that enabled him to embark in the buying of land in a large and ambitious way. Certainly there is no lack of data regarding the two foremost millionaires of the first decades of the 19th century, Stephen Gerard and John Jacob Astor. The very names of nearly all of the other powerful merchants of the age have receded into the densest obscurity. But both those of Gerard and Astor, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, it's Gerard, Gerard, it's G-I-R-A-R-D, so even Gerard, maybe for me at least, has faded into obscurity, but I know Astor. But, but both of the those of Gerard and Astor live vivifyingly, the first by virtue of a memorable benefaction, the second as the founder of one of the greatest fortunes in the world. Commerce surcharged with fraud. Because of their unexcelled success, these two were the targets for the bitter invective or the envy of their competitors on the one hand and on the other of the laudation of their friends and beneficiaries. Harsh statements were made as to the methods of both but in reality, if we but knew the truth, 
They were no worse than the other millionaires of the time, except in degree. The whole trading system was founded upon a combination of superior executive ability and superior cunning. Not ability in creating, but in being able to get hold of and distribute the products of others' creation. Fraudulent substitution was an active factor in many, if not all, of the shipping fortunes. The shippers and merchants practiced the grossest frauds upon the unsophisticated people. Walter Barrett, that pseudonymic merchant, who took part in them himself, and who writes glibly of them as fine tricks of trade, gives many instances in his volumes dealing with the merchants of that time. The firm of F. and G. Carnes, he relates, was one of the many which made a large fortune in the China trade. This firm found that Chinese yellow dogwood, when cut into proper sizes, bore a strong superficial resemblance to real turkey rhubarb. The Carnes brothers proceeded to have the wood packed in China in boxes counterfeiting those of the turkey product. They then made a regular traffic, importing this spurious and deleterious stuff, and selling it as the genuine turkey article at several times the cost. It entirely superseded the real product. This firm also sent to China samples of Italian, French, and English silks. The Chinese imitated them closely, and the bogus wares were imported into the United States, where they were sold as the genuine European goods. The Carnes's were but a, a type of their class. Writing of the trade carried on by the shipping class, Barrett says that the shippers sent to China samples of the most noted Paris and London products in sauces, condiments, preserves, sweetmeats, syrups, and other goods. The Chinese imitated them even to facsimiles of printed Paris and London labels. The fraudulent substitutions were then brought in cargoes to the United States where they were sold at fancy prices. Merchants, the pillars of society. This was the prevalent commercial system. The most infamous frauds were carried on, and so dominant were the traders' standards that these frauds passed as legitimate business methods. The very men who profited by them were the mainstays of churches, and not only that, but they were the very same men who formed the various self-constituted committees which demanded severe laws against paupers and petty criminals. What a bunch of hypocrites! Wow! A study of the names of the men, for instance, who comprised the New York Society for the Prevention of Pauperism from 1818 to 1823 shows that nearly all of them were merchants or shippers who participated in the current commercial frauds. Yet this was the class that sat in judgment upon the poverty of the people and the acts of poor criminals and which dictated laws to legislatures and to Congress. You want to know why I read these secular books, folks, these secular history books? 
I show you the chronic, the constant hypocrisy and rampant sin in history, in historical politics and society, in order to reinforce, for those of you who know Jesus Christ, to reinforce the fact that you need to trust in Jesus Christ and to know that everything in this world is sinful and a fraud. Everything, every one of us, apart from Christ, lies in darkness, in wickedness. All of history, secular history. We need Jesus Christ, and apart from that, we're helpless. That's why I show you, why I read to you secular history. Back to the book. Gerard and Astor were the super fine products of this stem. They did in a greater way what others did in a lesser way. As a consequence, their careers were fairly well illumined. The envious attacks of their competitors ascribed their success to hard-hearted and ignoble qualities, while their admirers heaped upon them tributes of praise for their extraordinary genius. Both sets exaggerated their success in garnering millions was merely an abnormal manifestation of an ambition prevalent among the trading class. Their methods were an adroit refinement of methods which were common. The game was one in which, while fortunes were being amassed, Masses of people were thrown into the direst poverty and their lives were attended by injustice and suffering. In this game, a large company of eminent merchants played. Gerard and Astor were peers in playing and got away with the greater share of the stakes. Post revolutionary conditions. Before describing Gerard's career, it is well to cast a retrospective fleeting glance into the conditions following the revolution. Despite the lofty sentiments of the Declaration of Independence, sentiments which were submerged by the propertied class when the cause was won, the gravity of law bore wholly in favor of the propertied interests. The propertyless had no place or recognition. The common man was good enough to shoulder a musket in the stress of war, but that he should have rights after the war, that was deemed absurd. In the whole scheme of government, neither the feelings nor the interests of the worker were thought of. That's just the same as today. The revolution brought no immediate betterment to his conditions. Such slight amelioration as came later was the result of years of agitation. No sooner was the revolution over than in stepped the propertied interests and assumed control of government functions. They were intelligent enough to know the value of class government, a lesson learned from the tactics of the British trading class. They knew the tremendous impact of law and how, directly and indirectly, it worked great transformations in the body social. While the worker was unorganized, unconscious of what his interests demanded, deluded by slogans and rallying cries, which really meant nothing to him, the propertied class was alert in its own interests.
properties rule entrenched. It proceeded to entrench itself in political as well as in financial power. The Constitution of the United States was so drafted as to take as much direct power from the people as the landed and trading interests dared. So much for your Constitution, folks. Most of the state constitutions were more pronounced in rigid property discrimination. In Massachusetts, no man could be governor unless he were a Christian worth a clear 1,000 pounds. In North Carolina, if he failed of owning the required 1,000 pounds in freehold estate, nor in Georgia if he did not own 500 acres of land and 4,000 pounds, nor in New Hampshire if he lacked owning 500 pounds in property. In South Carolina, he had to own 1,500 pounds in property clear of all debts. In New York, by the Constitution of 1777, only actual residents having freeholds to the value of 100 pounds free of all debts could vote for governor and other state officials. The laws were so arranged as effectually to disenfranchise those who had no property. In his reminiscences, Dr. John W. Francis tells of the prevalence for years in New York of a supercilious class which habitually sneered at the demand for political equality of the leather-breeched merchant with his few shillings a day. Theoretically, religious standards were the prevailing ones. In actuality, the ethics and methods of the propertied class were all powerful. The church might preach equality and humility and the list of virtues, but nevertheless, that did not give the propertyless man a vote. Thus it was that in communities professing the strongest religious convictions and embodying them in constitutions and in laws and customs, glaring inconsistencies ran side by side. The explanation lay in the fact that as regarded essential things of property, the standards of the trading class had supplanted the religious. Even the very admonition given by pastors to the poor, quote, be content with your lot, unquote, was a preachment entirely in harmony with the aims of the trading class, which, in order to make money, necessarily had to have a multitude of workers to work for it, and from whose labor the money in its finality had to come. In the very same breath that they advised the poverty-stricken to reverence their superiors and to expect their reward in heaven, the ministers glorified the aggrandizing merchants as God's chosen men who were called upon to do his work. Sounds like the 501c3 pastors of today. Since the laws favored the propertied interests, it was correspondingly easy for them to get direct control of government functions and personally exercise them. In New England, rich ship owners rose at once to powerful elective and appointive officers. Likewise, in New York, rich landowners and in the South, plantation men were selected for high offices. Law-making bodies from Congress down were filled with merchants, landowners, plantation men, and lawyers which last class was trained, as a rule, 
by association and self-interest to take the views of the propertied class and vote with and for it. A puissant politico-commercial aristocracy developed which at all times was perfectly conscious of its best interests. The worker was regaled with flattering commendations of the dignity of labor and sonorous generalizations and promises, but the ruling class took care of the laws. By means of these partial laws, the propertied interests early began to get tremendously valuable special privileges banking rights, canal construction, trade privileges, government favors, public franchises, all came in succession. The rigors of law on the poor. At the same time that laws were enacted or were twisted to suit the will of property, other laws were long in force, oppressing the poor to a terrifying degree. Poor debtors could be thrown in jail indefinitely, no matter how small a sum they owed. So much for your habeas corpus, folks. It never was. In law, the laborer was accorded few rights. It was easy to defraud him of his meager wages, since he had no lien upon the products of his labor. His labor power was all that he had to sell. And the value of this power was not safeguarded by law. But the products created by his labor power in the form of property were fortified by the severest laws. For the laborer to be in debt was equal to a crime, in fact, and in its results, it was worse than a crime. The burglar or pickpocket would get a certain sentence and then go free. The poor debtor, however, was compelled to languish in jail at the will of his creditor. Why do you think God's Mosaic Law outlawed usury? And credit. The report of the Prison Discipline Society for 1829 estimated that fully 75,000 persons were annually imprisoned for debt in the United States, and that more than one half of these owed less than $20. And such were the appalling conditions in these debtors' prisons that there was no distinction of sex, age, or character. All of the unfortunates were indiscriminately herded together. Sometimes, even in the inclement climate of the north, the jails were so poorly constructed that there was insufficient shelter from the elements. In the newspapers of the period, Advertisements may be read in which charitable societies or individuals appeal for food, fuel, and clothing for the inmates of these debtors' prisons. The thief and the murderer had a much more comfortable time of it in prison than the poor debtor. Wow, that's the, like the exact same today that... It is the exact... I mean, if you kill somebody, you'll probably get out quicker than a Kent Hovind, somebody who challenges the tax system. Or an Irwin Schiff. Those people are dealt with ultra-harshly, whereas if you merely kill somebody, hey, you'll, you, you rob somebody, you'll go to jail for a little bit, then you'll be out. With the lawmaking mercantile class the situation was very different. The state and national bankruptcy acts, as applied to merchants, bankers, storekeepers, the whole commercial class, were so loosely drafted 
and so laxly enforced and judicially interpreted that it was not hard to defraud creditors and escape with the proceeds. A propertied bankrupt could conceal his assets and hire adroit lawyers to get him off scot-free on quibbling technicalities, a condition which has survived to the present time, though in a lesser degree. But imprisonment for debt was not the only fate that befell the propertyless. According to the, quote, annual report of the managers of the Society for the Prevention of Pauperism in New York City, unquote, there were 12,000 paupers in New York City in 1820. Many of these were destitute Irish who, after having been plundered and dispossessed by the absentee landlords and the capitalists of their own country, were induced to pay their last farthing to the shippers for passage to America. There were laws providing that shipmasters must report to the mayors of cities and give a bond that the destitutes that they brought over should not become public charges. These laws were systematically and successfully evaded. Poor immigrants were dumped unceremoniously at obscure places along the coast from whence they had to make their way, carrying their baggage and beds to the cities the best that they could. Cadwallader D. Colden, mayor of New York for some years, tells in his reports of harrowing cases of death after death resulting from exposure due to this horrible form of exploitation. Sounds like the southern border with Mexico today. Now when the immigrant or native found himself in a state of near or complete destitution and resorted to the pawnbrokers or to theft, what happened? The law restricted pawnbrokers from charging more than 7% on amounts more than $25, but on amounts below that they were allowed to charge 25%, which, as the wage value of money then went, was oppressively high. Of course, the poor, with their cheap possessions, seldom owned anything on which they could get more than $25. Consequently, they were the victims of the most grinding legalized usury. Occasionally, some legislative committee recognized, although in a dim and unanalytic way, this onerous discrimination of law against the propertyless. Quote, There the pawnbrokers, their rates of interest, unquote, as an aldermanic committee reported in 1832, quote, have always been exorbitant and exceedingly oppressive. It has from time to time been regulated by law, and its sanctions have, parenthesis, as is usual upon most occasions when oppression has been legalized, in parenthesis, been made to fall most heavily upon the poor, end quotes. The committee continued with the following comments, which were naive in the extreme, considering that for generations all law had been made by and for the propertied interests. Quote, it is a singular fact that the smallest sums advanced have always been chargeable with the highest rates of interest. It is a fact worthy of consideration that by far the greater number of loans effected at these establishments are less than one dollar, and of the whole, 
twelve fifteenths are in sums less than one dollar and a half. On the other hand, the propertied class not only was able to raise money at a fairly low rate of interest, but, as will appear, had the free use of the people's money through the power of government to the extent of tens of millions of dollars. The penalties of poverty. If a man were absolutely destitute and took to theft as the only means of warding off starvation for himself or his family, the whole force of law at once descended heavily upon him. In New York State, the law decreed it, that it be grand larceny to steal to the value of twenty-five dollars, and in other states the statutes were equally severe. For stealing twenty-five dollars worth of anything, the penalty was three years in prison at hard labor. The unfortunate was usually put in the convict chain gang and forced to work along the roads. Street begging was prohibited by drastic laws. Poverty was substantially a crime. The moment a propertyless person stole, the assumption at once was that he was prima facie a criminal. But let the powerful propertied man steal, and government at once refused to see the criminal intent. If he were prosecuted, the usual outcome was that he never went to jail. Hundreds of specific instances could be given to prove this. One of the most noted of these was that of Samuel Startwout, Samuel Swartwout, sorry, who was collector of the port of New York for a considerable period and who, at the same time, was a financier and large land speculation promoter. It came out in 1838 that he had stolen the enormous sum of $1,222,705.69 from the government, which money he had used in his schemes. He was a fugitive from justice for a time, but upon his return was looked upon extenuatingly as the, quote, victim of circumstances, unquote, and he never languished in jail. Money was the standard of everything. The property person could commit any kind of crime short of murder and could at once get free on bail. But what happened to the accused who was poor? Here is a contemporaneous description of one of the prisons of the period. Quote, In Bridewell, white females of every grade of character, from the innocent, who is in the end acquitted, down to the basest wretch that ever disgraced the refuges of prostitution, are crowded into the same abandoned abode. With the white male prisons, the case is little altered. And so it is with the colored prisoners of both sexes. Hundreds are taken up and sent to these places, who, after remaining frequently several weeks, are found to be innocent of the crime alleged, and are then let loose upon the community." Unquote. Quote, let loose upon the community. Unquote. Does not this clause in itself convey volumes of significance of the attitude of the propertied interests, even when banded together in a pseudo quote unquote charitable enterprise toward the poverty stricken? While thus the charitable societies were holding up the destitute to scorn, 
and contumely as outcasts, and were loftily lecturing down to the poor on the evils of intemperance and gambling, practices which were astoundingly prevalent among the rich, at no time did they make any attempt to alter laws so glaringly unjust that they practically made poverty a distinct crime, subject to long terms of imprisonment. For instance, if a rich man were assaulted and made a complaint, all that he had to do was to give bail to ensure his appearance as a witness. But if a poor man or woman were cheated or assaulted and could not give bail to ensure his or her appearance at the trial, as a complaining witness, the law compelled the authorities to lock up that man or woman in prison. In the debates in the New York Constitutional Convention of 1846, Numerous cases were cited of this continuing barbarity in New York, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and other states. In Maryland, a young woman was assaulted and preferred criminal charges. As she could not give bail, she was locked up for 18 months as a detained witness. This was but one instance in thousands of similar cases. Master and Bonded Man For an apprenticed laborer to quit his master and job was a crime in law. Once caught, he was forthwith bundled off to jail, there to await the dispensation of his master. No matter how cruelly his master ill-treated him, However dissatisfied he was, the apprenticed laborer in law had no rights. Almost every day the newspapers of the 18th and the early part of the 19th century contained offers of rewards for the apprehension of fugitive apprentice laborers. From a survey of the Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts, and other colonial and state newspapers, it is clear that thousands of these apprentices had to resort to flight to escape their bondage. This is a specimen advertisement. Twenty dollars reward. Ran away from the subscriber, an apprentice boy named William Rusties, about eighteen years old in three months, by trade a house carpenter, of a dark complexion, dark eyebrows, black eyes, and black hair, about five feet eight inches high, his dress unknown, as he took with him different kinds of clothes. The above reward will be paid to any person that will secure him in gaol or return him to his master. George Lloyd, number 12, First Street. In contradistinction to the scorpion-like laws which worked such injustice to the poor and which made a mockery of doctrines of equality before the law, the propertied interests endowed themselves by their control of government with invaluable exemptions and peculiarly profitable special privileges. Even where, in civil cases, all men, theoretically, had an equal chance in courts of equity, litigation was made so expensive, whether purposely or not, that justice was really a one-sided pastime, in which the rich man could easily wear out the poor contestant. Boy, that hasn't changed. This, however, is not the place for a di dissertation on that most remarkable of noteworthy sorcerer's arts, the making of justice an expensive luxury, while still deluding the people with the notion that the law knows no preferences. 
the preferences, which are more to the point at present, are those in which government force is used to enrich the already rich and impoverish the impoverished still further. At the very time that property was bitterly resisting enlightened pleas for abolition of imprisonment for debt, for the enactment of a mechanics lien law, and for the extension of the suffrage franchise, it was using the public money of the whole people for its personal and private enterprises. In works dealing with those times, it is not often that we get penetration into the underlying methods of the trading class. But a lucid insight is inadvertently given by Walter Barrett, who for 60 years was in the mercantile trade. In his smug and conventional but quaintly entertaining volumes entitled The Merchants of Old New York. This strong instance shows like a flashlight that while the success of the shippers was attributed to a fine category of energetic qualities, the benevolent assistance of the United States government was, in a large measure, responsible for part of their accumulations. The Shippers' Huge Graft The Griswolds of New York owned the ship and called the Panama. She carried spelter, lead, iron, and other products to China, and returned with tea, false cinnamon, and various other Chinese goods. The duty on these was extremely high, but the government was far more lenient to the trading class than the trader was to the poor debtor. It generously extended credit for nine, twelve, and eighteen months before it demanded the payment of the tariff duties. What happened under this system? As soon as the ship arrived, the cargo was sold at a profit of 50%. The Griswolds, for example, would pocket their profits instead of using their own capital in further ventures. They would have the gratuitous use of government money, that is to say, the people's money, for periods of from six months to a year and a half. Thus the endless chain was kept up. According to Barrett, this was the customary attitude of the government toward merchants. It was anything but unusual for a merchant to have the free use of government money to the sum of four or five hundred thousand dollars. Quote, John Jacob Astor, unquote, says Barrett, in a view of admiration, quote, at one period of his life, had several vessels operating in this way. They would go to the Pacific and carry furs from thence to Canton. These would be sold at large profits. Then the cargoes of tea would pay enormous duties which Astor did not have to pay to the United States for a year and a half. His tea cargoes would be sold for good four and six months paper or perhaps cash, so that for eighteen or twenty years John Jacob Astor had what was actually a free of interest loan from the government of over five millions of dollars. Quote, oh, unquote, Quote, one house, unquote, continues Barrett, quote, was Thomas H. Smith and Sons. This firm went enormously into the Canton trade, and, although possessing originally but a few thousand dollars, Smith imported to such an extent that when he failed, he owed the United States three millions, $1,500. 
and not a cent has ever been paid, unquote. Was Smith imprisoned for debt? Not at all. It is such revelations as these that indicate how it was possible for the shippers to pile up great fortunes at a time when, quote, a house that could raise $260,000 in specie had an uncommon capital, unquote. They showed how the same functions of government which were used as an engine of such oppressive power against the poor, were perverted into highly efficient auxiliary of trading class aims and ambitions. By multifarious subtle workings, these class laws inevitably had a double effect. They poured wealth into the coffers of the merchant class, and simultaneously tended to drive the masses into poverty. The gigantic profits taken in by merchants had to be borne by the worker, perhaps not superficially, but in reality so. They came from his slender wages, from the tea and cotton and woolen goods that he used, the sugar and the coffee and so on. In this indirect way, the shippers absorbed the great part of the products of his labor. What they did not expropriate, the landlord did. Then, when the laborer fell in debt to the middleman tradesman, to jail he went. Unite against the worker. The worker denounced these discriminations as barbarous and unjust, but he could do nothing. The propertied class, with its keen understanding of what was best for its interests, acted and voted and usually dragooned the masses of enfranchised into voting for men and measures entirely favorable to its designs. Boy, that sounds like today. Sometimes these interests conflicted as they did when a part of New England became manufacturing centers and favored a high protective tariff in opposition to the importing trades, the plantation owners and the agricultural class in general. Then the vested class would divide and each side would appeal with passionate and patriotic exhortations to the voting elements of the people to sustain it or the country would go to ruin. But when the working class made demands for better laws, the propertied class as a whole united to oppose the workers bitterly. However it divided on the tariff, or the question of state or national banks, substantially the whole trading class solidly combated the principle of manhood suffrage, and the movements for the wiping out of laws for imprisonment for debt, for mechanics liens, and for the establishment of shorter hours of work. Political institutions and their offspring, in the form of laws being generally in the control of the trading class, the conditions were extraordinarily favorable for the accumulation of large fortunes, especially on the part of the shipowners, the dominant class. The grand climax of the galaxy of American fortunes during the period from 1800 to 1831, the greatest of all the fortunes up to the beginning of the third decade of that century, was that of Girard, G-I-R-A-R-D. He built up what was looked up to as the gigantic fortune of about ten millions of dollars and far overtopped every other strainer for money except Astor, who survived him seventeen years and whose wealth increased 
during that time to double the amount that Gerard left. Okay, we're going to take a break and continue with Chapter 6 uh, in a few minutes. Okay, we're back. This is Chapter 6, Volume 1 of Gustavus Myers' The History of the Great American Fortunes. Gerard, the richest of the shippers. Gerard was born at Bordeaux, France on May 21st, 1750, and was the eldest of five children of Captain Pierre Gerard, a mariner. When eight years old, he became blind in one eye, a loss and deformity which subjected his sensibilities to severe trials and which had the effect of rendering him morose and sour. It was his lament in later life that while his brothers had been sent to college, he was the ugly duckling of the family and came in for his father's neglect and a shrewish stepmother's waspishness. At about 14 years of age, he relieved himself of these home troubles and ran away to sea. During the nine years that he sailed between Bordeaux and the West Indies, he rose from cabin boy to mate. Evading the French law, which required that no man should be made master of a ship unless he had sailed two cruises in the Royal Navy and was 25 years old, Gerard got command of a trading vessel when about 22 years old. While in this service, he clandestinely carried cargoes of his own, which he sold at considerable profit. In May 1776, while en route from New Orleans to a Canadian port, he became enshrouded in a fog off the Delaware Capes, signaled for aid, and when the fog had cleared away sufficiently for an American ship nearby to come to his assistance, learned that war was on. He thereupon scurried for Philadelphia, where he sold vessel and cargo, of which latter only a part belonged to him, and with the proceeds opened up a cider and wine bottling and grocery business in a small store on Water Street. Girard made money fast, and in July 1777 married Mary Lum, a woman of his own class. She is usually described as a servant girl of great beauty, and as one whose temper was of quite tempestuous violence. This unfortunate woman subsequently lost her reason. Undoubtedly, her husband's meannesses and his forbidding qualities contributed to the process. One of his most favorable biographers thus describes him, quote, In person he was short and stout, with a dull, repulsive countenance, which... His bushy eyebrows and solitary eye almost made hideous. He was cold and reserved in manner and was disliked by his neighbors, the most of whom were afraid of him, unquote. During the British occupation of Philadelphia, he was charged by the revolutionists with extreme double-dealing and duplicity in pretending to be a patriot and taking the oath of allegiance to the colonies while secretly trading with the British. None of his biographers deny this. While merchant after merchant was being bankrupted from disruption of trade, Gerard was incessantly making money. By 1780 he was again in the shipping trade, his vessels plying between American ports and New Orleans and San Domingo. Not the least of his profits, it was said, came from slave trading. How Gerard built his ships. A troublous partnership with his brother, Captain Jean Gerard, lasted but a short time. The brothers could not agree. At the dissolution in 1790, Stephen Gerard's share of the profits amounted to $30,000. Gerard's greatest stroke came from the insurrection of the San Domingo Negroes against the French several years later. He had two vessels lying in the harbor, 
of one of the island ports. At the first mutterings of danger, a number of planters took their valuables on board one of these ships and scurried back to get the remainder. The sequel, as commonly narrated, is represented thus. The planters failed to return, evidently falling victims to the fury of the insurrectionists. The vessels were taken to Philadelphia, and Girard persistently advertised for the owners of the valuables. As no owners ever appeared, Girard sold the goods and put the proceeds, $50,000, into his own bank account. Quote, unquote, this, says Houghton, quote, was a great assistance to him, and the next year he began the building of those splendid ships which enabled him to engage so actively in the Chinese and West India trades. From this time on, his profits were colossal. His ships circumnavigated the world many times, and each voyage brought him a fortune. He practiced all of those arts of deception which were current among the trading class, and which were accepted as shrewdness and were inseparably associated with legitimate business methods. In giving one of his captains instructions, he wrote, as was his invariable policy, the most explicit directions to exercise secretiveness and cunning in his purchases of coffee at Batavia. Be cautious and prudent, was his admonition. Keep to yourself the intention of the voyage and the amount of specie that you have on board. To satisfy the curious, throw them off the scent by telling them that the ship will take in molasses, rice, and sugar if the price is very low, adding that the whole will depend upon the success in selling the small Liverpool cargo. If you do this, the cargo of coffee can be bought 10% cheaper than it would be if it is publicly known that there is a quantity of Spanish dollars on board. Besides a valuable cargo of British goods intended to be invested in coffee for Stephen Gerard of Philadelphia. By 1810, we see him ordering the bearings of London to invest in shares of the Bank of the United States half a million dollars which they held for him. When the charter expired, he was the principal creditor of that bank and he bought, at a great bargain, the bank and the cashier's house for a hundred and twenty thousand dollars. On May 12, 1812, he opened the Girard Bank with a capital of one million two hundred thousand dollars, which he increased the following year by one hundred thousand dollars more. A Dictator of Finance his wealth was now overshadowingly great, his power immense. He was a veritable dictator of the realms of finance, an assiduous, repellent little man with his devil's eye, who rode roughshod over every obstacle in his path. His every movement bred fear. His veriest word could bring ruin to anyone who dared cross his purposes. The War of 1812 brought disaster to many a merchant, but Gerard harvested fortune from the depths of misfortune. Quote, he was, it must be said, unquote, says Houghton, quote, hard and illiberal in his bargains, and remorseless in exacting the last cent due him, unquote. And after he opened the Gerard Bank, quote, Finding that the salaries which had been paid by the government were higher than those paid elsewhere, he cut them down to the rate given by the other banks. The watchman had always received from the old bank the gift of an overcoat at Christmas, but Gerard put a stop to this. He gave no gratuities to any of his employees, but confined them to the compensation for which they had bargained. Yet he contrived to get out of them service more devoted than was received by other men who paid 
higher wages and made presents. Sounds like Walmart. Appeals to him for aid were unanswered. No poor man ever came full-handed from his presence. He turned a deaf ear to the entreaties of failing merchants to help them on their feet again. He was neither generous nor charitable. When his faithful cashier died after long years spent in his service, he manifested the most hardened indifference to the bereavement of the family of that gentleman and left them to struggle along as best they could, unquote. Wow. Wow. A real-life Scrooge. Further, Huffton unconsciously proceeds to bring out several incidents which show the exorbitant profits Gerard made from his various business activities. In the spring of 1813, one of his ships was captured by a British cruiser at the mouth of the Delaware. Fearing that his prize would be recaptured by an American warship if he sent her into port, the English admiral notified Gerard that he would ransom the ship for $180,000 in coin. Gerard paid the money and... Even after paying that sum, the cargo of silks, nankings, and teas yielded him a profit of half a million dollars. His very acts of apparent public spirit were means by which he scooped in large profits. Several times when the rate of exchange was so high as to be injurious to general business, he drew upon the Bering brothers for sums of money to be transferred to the United States. This was hailed as a public benefaction. But what did Gerard do? He disposed of the money to the Bank of the United States and charged 10% for the service. Bribery and Intimidation The reestablishment and enlarged sway of this bank were greatly due to his efforts and influence. He became its largest stockholder and one of its directors. No business institution in the first three decades of the 19th century exercised such a sinister and overshadowing influence as this chartered monopoly. The full tale of its indirect bribery of politicians and newspaper editors in order to perpetuate its great privileges and keep a hold upon public opinion has never been set forth. But sufficient facts were brought out when, after years of partisan agitation, Congress was forced to investigate and found that not a few of its own members for years had been on the payrolls of the bank. In order to get its charter renewed from time to time and retain its extraordinary special privileges, the United States Bank systematically debauched politics and such of the press, as was venal. And when a critical time came, as it did in 1832 to 1834, when the mass of the people sided with President Jackson in his aim to overthrow the bank, it instructed the whole press at its command, to raise the cry of, quote, the fearful consequences of revolution, anarchy, and despotism, unquote, which assuredly would ensue if Jackson were re-elected. To give one instance of how, for years, it had manipulated the press, the Courier and Inquirer was a powerful New York newspaper, its owners, Webb and Noah, suddenly deserted Jackson and began to denounce him. The reason was, as revealed by a congressional investigation, that they had borrowed $50,000 from the United States Bank, which lost no time in giving them the alternative of paying up or supporting the bank. Gerard's share in the United States Bank brought him millions of dollars, 
with its control of deposits of government funds and by the provisions of its charter, this bank swayed the whole money marts of the United States and could manipulate them at will. It could advance or depress prices as it chose. Many times, Girard and his fellow directors were severely denounced for the arbitrary power he wielded. But, and let the fact be noted, the denunciation came largely from the owners of the state banks who sought to supplant the United States Bank. The struggle was really one between two sets of capitalistic interests, shipping and banking were the chief sources of Girard's wealth, with side investments in real estate and other forms of property. He owned large tracts of land in Philadelphia, the value of which increased rapidly with the growth of population. He was a heavy stockholder in river navigation companies, and near the end of his life he subscribed $200,000 toward the construction of the Danville and Pottsville Railroad. The Solitary Cressus He was at this time a solitary, crusty old man living in a four-story house on Water Street, pursued by the contumely of everyone, even of those who flattered him for mercenary purposes. Children he had none, and his wife was long since dead. His great wealth brought him no comfort. The environment with which he surrounded himself was mean and sordid. Many of his clerks lived in better style. There, in his dingy habitation, this lone, weazened veteran of commerce immersed himself in the works of Voltaire, Diderot, Paine, and Rousseau, of whom he was a profound admirer and after whom some of his best ships were named. This grim miser had, after all, the one great redeeming quality of being true to himself, he made no pretense to religion, and had an abhorrence of hypocrisy. Kant was not in his nature. Out into the world he went, a ferocious shark, cold-eyed for prey, but he never cloaked his motives beneath a calculating exterior of piety or benevolence. Thousands upon thousands he had deceived, for business was business, but himself he never deceived. His bitter scoffs at what he termed theologic absurdities and superstitions, and his terrific rebuffs to ministers who appealed to him for money, undoubtedly called forth a considerable share of the odium which was hurled upon him. He defied the anathemas of organized churchdom. He took hold of the commercial world and shook it harshly and emerged laden with spoils. To the last, his volcanic spirit flashed forth even when, eighty years old, he lay with an ear cut off, his face bruised, and his sight entirely destroyed, the result of being felled by a wagon. In all his eighty-one years, charity had no place in his heart. But after, on December 26th, 1831, he lay stone dead, and his will was opened, what a surprise there was. His relatives all received bequests. His very apprentices each got five hundred dollars, and his old servants annuities. Hospitals, orphan societies, and other charitable associations all benefited. Five hundred thousand dollars went to the city of Philadelphia for certain civic improvements. 
$300,000 for the canals of Pennsylvania. A portion of his valuable estate in Louisiana to New Orleans for the improvement of that city. The remainder of the estate, about six millions, was left to trustees for the creation and endowment of a college for orphans, which was promptly named after him. A chorus of astonishment and laudation went up. Was there ever such magnificence of public spirit? Did ever so lofty a soul live who was so misunderstood? Here and there a protesting voice was feebly heard that Gerard's wealth came from the community and that it was only justice that it should revert to the community, that his methods had resulted in widows and orphans, and that his money should be applied to the support of those orphans. These protests were frowned upon as the mouthings of cranks or the ravings of impotent envy. Applause was lavished upon Gerard. His very clothes were preserved as immemorial mementos. The Great Benefactor All of the benefactions of the other rich men of the period waned into insignificance compared to those of Gerard. His competitors and compeers had given to charity, but none on so great a scale as Gerard. Distinguished orators vied with one another in extolling his wonderful benefactions, and the press showered encomiums upon him as that of the greatest benefactor of the age. To them this honestly seemed so, for they were trained by the standards of the trading class, by the sophistries of political economists, and by the spirit of the age, to concentrate their attention upon the powerful and successful only, while disregarding the condition of the masses of the people. Sounds like today's education. The pastimes of a king or the foibles of some noted politician or rich man were things of magnitude and were much expatiated upon while the common man, singly or in mass, was of absolutely no importance. The finely turned rhetoric of the orators, pleasing as it was to that generation, is, judged by modern standards, well-nigh meaningless and worthless. In that high-flown oratory, with its carefully studied exordiums, periods, and perorations can be clearly discerned the reverence given to power as embodied by possession of property. But nowhere do we see any explanation, or even an attempt at explanation, of the basic means by which this property was acquired, or of its effect upon the masses of the people. Woefully lacking in facts are the productions of the time as to how the great body of the workers lived and what they did. Facts as to the rich are fairly available, although not abundant, but facts regarding the rest of the population are pitifully few. <laughs> it's the same thing today. Who do they make movies out of? Uh, rich and famous people. And the poor man is ignored. The patient seeker for truth. The mind which is not content with the presentation of one side, such a person finds, with some impatience, that only a few writers thought it worthwhile to give even scant attention to the condition of the working class. One of these few was Matthew Carey, an orthodox political economist who, in a pamphlet issued in 1829, gave this picture which forms both a contrast and a sequel 
to the accumulations of multi-millionaires, of which Girard was then the archetype. A stark contrast presented. Quote, Thousands of our laboring people travel hundreds of miles in quest of employment on canals at 62.5 cents to 87.5 cents per day, paying $1.50 to $2 a week for board, leaving families behind depending upon them for support. They labor frequently in marshy grounds, where they inhale pestiferous miasmata, which destroy their health often irrevocably. They return to their poor families broken-hearted and with ruined constitutions, with a sorry pittance most laboriously earned, and take to their beds sick and unable to work. Hundreds are swept off annually, many of them leaving numerous and helpless families. Notwithstanding their wretched fate, their places are quickly supplied by others, although death stares them in the face. Hundreds are most laboriously employed on turnpikes, working from morning to night at from half a dollar to three quarters a day, exposed to the broiling sun in summer and all the inclemency of our severe winters. There is always a redundancy of woodpilers in our cities whose wages are so low that their utmost efforts do not enable them to earn more than from 35 to 50 cents a day. Finally, there is no employment whatever, how disagreeable or loathsome or deleterious soever it may be, or however reduce the wages, that does not find persons willing to follow it rather than beg or steal. Unquote. Okay, that was chapter 6 of volume 1 of Gustavus Myers's The History of the Great American Fortunes. I am reminded of the time, just reading of, of uh, how these scumbags, these ruthless scumbags can compile wealth like that. I'm reminded of the time way back when, uh, seven or eight years ago, when I was first starting, just starting to get it about the world. And I, my wife and I were going to the corporate church of which I spoke a couple of shows back. With, and I was, uh, I was in the car. I was going for a, taking a ride somewhere with that corporate pastor of mine that I used to respect and like so much. And in some ways I still do. He's a heck of a really good guy, but clueless. But I remember, uh, we were talking about money and debt, and I, I mentioned to him, wouldn't it be great if God's law were still in effect and every 50 years was a jubilee year and all debts had to be canceled? Wouldn't that be great, Pastor, I said to him. And of course, I, was, I had in mind, wouldn't it be great if the Rockefellers had to give up their money and all of these super ultra rich Shylocks had to become equal with you and I. Wouldn't that be great to do that as God intended? And my pastor, I remember in the car, he said, eh, he poo pooed it. He said, eh, if we did that in just a few years, all the people who are super rich now, all the people with money, they'd have money again because they just know how to get it. So, it wouldn't matter. And, and at the time, I, I just shut up and said, oh, all right. But I wasn't happy with it. I just didn't quite know how to rebut that. Well, boy, anybody tries that on me nowadays. <laughs> I wish I could go back in time. Honestly, I wish I could go back in time and sit in that car with him again and hear that corporate pastor say that to me uh, because I know exactly what I would t say to him. I would say to him, Pastor, are you adhering, <laughs> back up, Pastor, <laughs> are you quoting the law of God or are you quoting the law of Limbaugh? 
because I know that's exactly where he was getting that in retrospect. Because I used to be an idiot ditto head 10 or 15 years ago. And I, I remember now, retrospectively, I remember hearing uh, that hellbound Rush Limbaugh, that shill, multi-million making shill say that, uh, that very thing. So my pastor was uh, adhering to the law of Limbaugh and not the law of our Lord. Just, just really sad. Really, really, really sad. Uh, it'd be great if we had a jubilee year. All right. Um, this has been the Ministry of Truth. I'm Gordon Comstock of our mainstream media today. This omission is characteristic inasmuch as it leaves the reader in complete ignorance of the kind of methods Astor used in heaping up millions from the shipping trade Millions that enabled him to embark in the buying of land in a large and ambitious way. Certainly there is no lack of data regarding the two foremost millionaires of the first decades of the 19th century, Stephen Gerard and John Jacob Astor. The very names of nearly all of the other powerful merchants of the age have receded into the densest obscurity. But both those of Gerard and Astor, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, it's Gerard, Gerard, it's G-I-R-A-R-D. So even Gerard, maybe for me at least, has faded into obscurity, but I know Astor. But, but both of the those of Gerard and Astor live vivifyingly, the first by virtue of a memorable benefaction, the second as the founder of one of the greatest fortunes in the world. Commerce surcharged with fraud. Because of their unexcelled success, these two were the targets for the bitter invective or the envy of their competitors on the one hand and, on the other, of the laudation of their friends and beneficiaries. Harsh statements were made as to the methods of both, but in reality, if we but knew the truth, they were no worse than the other millionaires of the time, except in degree. The whole trading system was founded upon a combination of superior executive ability and superior cunning. Not ability in creating, but in being able to get hold of and distribute the pro The fraudulent substitutions were then brought in cargoes to the United States where they were sold at fancy prices. Merchants, the pillars of society. This was the prevalent commercial system. The most infamous frauds were carried on, and so dominant were the traders' standards that these frauds passed as legitimate business methods. The very men who profited by them were the mainstays of churches, and not only that, but they were the very same men who formed the various self-constituted committees which demanded severe laws against paupers and petty criminals. What a bunch of hypocrites. Wow. A study of the names of the men, for instance, who comprised the New York Society for the Prevention of Pauperism from 1818 to 1823 shows that nearly all of them were merchants or shippers who participated in the current commercial frauds. Yet this was the class that sat in judgment upon the poverty of the people 
and the acts of poor criminals, and which dictated laws to legislatures and to Congress. You want to know why I read these secular books, folks, these secular history books? I show you the chronic, the constant hypocrisy and rampant sin in history, in historical politics and society, in order to reinforce, for those of you who know Jesus Christ, to reinforce the fact that you need to trust in Jesus Christ and to know that everything in this world is sinful and a fraud. Everything, every one of us, apart from Christ, lies in darkness, in wickedness. All of history, secular history. We need Jesus Christ, and apart from that, we're helpless. That's why I show you, why I read to you secular history. This is the Ministry of Truth. I'm Gordon Comstock. And we're going to get into Chapter 5 here of Volume 1 of Gustavus Myers' uh, The History of the Great American Fortunes, The Shippers and Their Times. Unfortunately, only the most general and eulogistic accounts of the careers of most of the rich shippers have appeared in such biographies as have been published. Scarcely any details are preserved of the underlying methods and circumstances by which these fortunes were amassed. Sixty years ago, when it was the unqualified fashion to extol the men of wealth as great public benefactors and truckle to them, it still is the fashion, Gustavus. It's that, that fashion has returned. And when sociological inquiry was in an undeveloped stage, there might have been some excuse for this, but it is extremely unsatisfactory to find pretentious writers of the present day glossing over essential facts or not taking the trouble to get them. A quote-unquote popular writer who has pretended to deal with the origin of one, of one of the great present fortunes, the Astor fortune. Here we go, we're getting into the, uh, the robber baron families. Ha and has already given facts, although conventionally interpreted, as to one or two of Astor's land transactions, passes over with a sentence with a single sentence, the fundamental facts as to Astor's shipping activities, and entirely ignores the peculiar special privileges worth millions of dollars that Astor, in conjunction with other merchants, had as a free gift from the government. This omission is characteristic. You get the feeling Gustavus Myers, were he alive today, could see right through the lies. Back to the book. Gerard and Astor were the superfine products of this stem. They did in a greater way what others did in a lesser way. As a consequence, their careers were fairly well illumined. The envious attacks of their competitors ascribed their success to hard-hearted and ignoble qualities, while their admirers heaped upon them tributes of praise for their extraordinary genius. Both sets exaggerated their success in garnering millions was merely an abnormal manifestation of an ambition prevalent among the trading class. Their methods were an adroit refinement of methods which were common 
the game was one in which, while fortunes were being amassed, masses of people were thrown into the direst poverty and their lives were attended by injustice and suffering. In this game, a large company of eminent merchants played. Gerard and Astor were peers in playing and got away with the greater share of the stakes. Post-Revolutionary Conditions Before describing Gerard's career, it is well to cast a retrospective fleeting glance into the conditions following the revolution. Despite the lofty sentiments of the Declaration of Independence, sentiments which were submerged by the propertied class when the cause was won, the gravity of law bore wholly in favor of the propertied interests. The propertyless had no place or recognition. The common man was good enough to shoulder a musket in the stress of war, but that he should have rights after the war, that was deemed absurd. In the whole scheme of government, neither the feelings nor the interests of the products of others' creation. Fraudulent substitution was an active factor in many, if not all, of the shipping fortunes. The shippers and merchants practiced the grossest frauds upon the unsophisticated people. Walter Barrett, that pseudonymic merchant, who took part in them himself, and who writes glibly of them as fine tricks of trade, gives many instances in his volumes dealing with the merchants of that time. The firm of F. and G. Carnes, he relates, was one of the many which made a large fortune in the China trade. This firm found that Chinese yellow dogwood when cut into proper sizes, bore a strong superficial resemblance to real turkey rhubarb. The Carnes brothers proceeded to have the wood packed in China in boxes counterfeiting those of the turkey product. They then made a regular traffic importing this spurious and deleterious stuff and selling it as the genuine turkey article at several times the cost. It entirely superseded the real product. This firm also sent to China samples of Italian, French, and English silks. The Chinese imitated them closely and the bogus wares were imported into the United States, where they were sold as the genuine European goods. The Carneses were but a, a type of their class. Writing of the trade carried on by the shipping class, Barrett says that the shippers sent to China samples of the most noted Paris and London products in sauces, condiments, preserves, sweetmeats, syrups, and other goods. The Chinese imitated them even to facsimiles of printed Paris and London labels.